Good morning. I think we'll get started. Uh, most of you know I'm Lena Kaiser. I'm one of the members of the Animal Welfare Committee from the MDMA and have been involved in this conference for its, since its inception, which actually this is the seventh year of our conference. Um, and so I think we and our committee are to be congratulated for being on the forefront of animal welfare and continuing to bring in international experts. One thing we do that is different than most of the conferences that are held in association with veterinary, um, veterinary meetings is that we have a whole bunch of really small donors who donate between $250 and $500 to this conference. And the reason is, I think, my opinion, that we encourage controversy and we encourage people to have different views and we like for you to leave and rethink about things that you thought you knew. And so major corporations are not interested in having their windmills tipped. So I consider that we're windmill tippers in that regard. So um, we need to thank our donors, and that would be Warringer Engelim, Zoet Hester, Dean Foods, who has provided and has continued to provide ice cream and milk over there. Take it whenever you need it. Um, College of Vet Med, College of Animal Science, Jennifer Walker and Dominic for Animal Welfare, Pixie's Animal Welfare Society, Kaiser Cattle, yes, that's my part, um, Narrow Work Enterprises, Child Therapeutic Riding, and Kitty Park Animal Hospital. Um, I also need to mention that apparently there's an accident on 127, so many of the people who think they were going to be on time are not. Um, it says here that I'm supposed to thank the Animal Welfare Committee for doing this, and that I have to thank myself. Okay, and uh, the chair of the committee, Marcy Barber, um, for making this happen. And so with that in mind, um, Marcy, our chair, Dr. Barber, will introduce our first speaker. The other thing I need to mention, if you haven't been here before, the bathrooms are out the door in that way. And if you have a question, we have a microphone, microphone right there so that Marcy doesn't have to run around. And we're recording today, right? And we are recording, so eventually these will be online. So because we are recording today, please, when you have a question from one of our speakers, please make your way to the microphone so that the question can be heard on the recording. Because um, it's always painful after the fact to try to be like this. Yeah. So, um, as Lena said, I am the chair of the Animal Welfare Committee. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I want to thank the MBMA staff for their help in making this meeting happen. And I always look forward to this meeting because of the thought-provoking content and often lively discussion. You should not expect to leave here today agreeing with everything you hear. My hope for this day is that we engage in discussion. Before I introduce the first speaker, I would like to take a moment to thank Dr. Elena Kaiser. See, you didn't have to thank yourself. <laughs> For all of her efforts in making this meeting happen, she is consistently one step ahead of us, and this meeting would not be possible without her. Thank you. <laughs> so our first speaker today is Dr. Carla Carlton. She is a member of our Animal Welfare Committee. Um, she is an MSU CDM faculty member who is board certified in theogenology and animal welfare and does teaching and clinical services for the college. She received her DDM from Kansas State University and did her residency in theriogenology at Ohio State, focusing on large animals, small animal exotics, and zoo animals. She also practiced large animal medicine in Oklahoma. Her international activities began in 1992 with 25 years of assisting with work in India and 21 years in Southeast Asia predominantly in Thailand and Cambodia. Welcome. Well, good morning. Glad you're all here. And hopefully others will show up as the traffic clears. Last, uh, this last weekend, I was along with two CDM teams, and actually Derek from Guelph is here also. This was the weekend for the, inter the Collegiate Animal Welfare 
judging contest. It was at Ohio State. So we left yesterday just shy of 2 p.m. Central Time and drove all night and got home about midnight from the welfare judging contest. Uh, Rachel Baumgartner, one of our third year students, had the third individual honors in uh, the judging in the CDM division and the CDM team from Michigan State came in second overall to the Ohio State University team. But that's okay. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but we're really proud of them. They, they did a terrific job. And, and it's always a high tense moment, especially when, if any of you had animal science backgrounds and then judging in co you know, college for different team events, and they had everything from farm fish, meat rabbits, uh, a live assessment of pigs, and I can't remember. They did your world. Oh, that's what it is. Well, thank you. That might be a little bit better. And so anyway, they, they are they have a lot of things thrown at them, but they did a really good job. So anyway, I appreciate the opportunity today to just take a short time to share with you a project that has been underway for about 21 years to address health and welfare issues of working equids in Thailand and Cambodia. It's become rather a passion of mine. And with one exception, these are all images that I have taken. And sometimes it's pretty discouraging when you look at what happens with animals that are absolutely integral to the survival of the people if we have them. And Thai ponies, again, are really but a small number of the equids that we have worldwide. But of the 112 million, about 60 of those are horses or ponies, and then we have donkeys and mules. And only about 10% of the equids globally are actually involved in sport, which means that 90% of them are working and absolutely critical to the survival of the people who have them. The upper left-hand image is a little pony in the mountains of Northeast Thailand, carrying uh, banana tree logs, things like that. Do we have a problem? You gotta turn oh, it it's on. not showing. You How about we get that, do that, is that it? Uh-oh. Well, perfect. It's there, then I will, this is the images that you missed if we go back here. All right, so the ones that I did take that are there, thank you very much for stopping me. Uh, a couple of these are from Morocco, and then some from Cambodia and elsewhere. And you know, you look at them and you go, man, they're really bad shape, and these are actually some of the good ones. Uh, but the one in the upper left, again, those banana tree logs, the one in the lower left took out of a moving car window, but you can look at the size of the loads, what we think is adequate for transportation and handling. And then sugar cane is the one, the pony that's in pretty good shape, that was again in Cambodia. And so they are absolutely used for many fronts. They have a lot of different roles they play as working equids from agriculture and really often subsistence farming. Occasionally you'll have little ones like the guy in the center that are used for tourist trades. And it's really heartbreaking when you see a tiny little pony that has a low body condition score with a 300 pound westerner lunking on the back and you go, so not right. And I, so we try to increase awareness of what's right or wrong and then you look at the size of the vehicles. Sometimes they say, well, it's rubber tires, so they move faster, so it's less of a load for the pony. But not really. You know, the weight is still the weight when you're trying to get that, that load moving and get it underway. So just to give you a little bit of focus of where most of my work has been done, China, clearly everybody knows where that is on the globe. But we went from uh, southern Thailand around Bangkok, and where most of our work is done here in this upper area of Thailand in the northeast. And uh, <clears throat> so I have another image that shows that number one area of the northern provinces of Thailand where I spend most of my time. We are bordered by Myanmar or Burma to the left-hand side of that image. And then we get into Cambodia, which is down near numbers two and four, but usually mountainous regions. Anybody that was serving in, in Vietnam knows well how hot and muggy the summers are and the working conditions can be really challenging. There is a carriage trade in Lampang province in Lampang City, which is in the very center of that northern part, where there's a really active tourist trade. And so we have carriages that are driven by the locals. And you'll notice all of the carriage drivers have cowboy hats of some variation. Nobody knows why. But they all wear cowboy hats, and they're quite proud of that thing. And most of those ponies are in fairly good shape. But some things went wrong a number of years ago when I was first invited to visit. And so we had just gone back from the conference that was in Lampang, and from the middle Lampang up here back down to Bangkok, which is at the bottom part of the green, is about an eight hour drive. 
We had just returned to Bangkok. We got a phone call and said, we have problems. Can you please come back? And it's like, certainly. So we go back. And they actually let us go to some of the back paddocks of ponies that were not on the, on the streets of the city of Lampang. And we found some pretty dire circumstances. The carriage ponies that are out and visible, usually pretty good. The one in the backs, back paddocks and areas around the city did not. And if you've never seen a case of big head disease, this is where the facial bones start thinning and really widening out. And it, this is secondary to the diet, which is a rice-based diet. So high phosphorus, essentially no calcium. And so the calcium starts getting leached out of the bones, trying to balance the, the body's uh, functions that it needs for a proper calcium phosphorus diet. And then there's also a grass that's often fed called ceteria. And it has that oxalates in it, and that ties up additional calcium. So we have ponies that were in pretty bad circumstances. And we had to figure out what it was we were going to do about it. So we, we started looking early on with the ponies that we encountered, looking at nutritional deficits, again, primarily diet-related, the fact that a lot of them were really lame. When you have a carriage pony going down the streets of Lampang and it's not clip-clop, clip-clop, you heard the horrible measures and the, the, the footfall that was clearly evidence of lameness. We had individuals that had really terrible wounds and the level of education that was lacking, not realizing that if you cleaned a wound, it would heal faster because there just was a lack of education. And we wanted to take a look at some of the diseases we encountered. This disease is not really a disease down here. This is a mare that had foal. This was her foal from that year. And she started off with a low body condition score. And with the diet she had, she was essentially at body condition one or two simply because of lactation and trying to help her foal. The environment in which we worked was, again, always challenging because it's not typical anything anywhere. So we decided one of the ways we would work with that with any university is to try to work with education. We had the challenges there that so many of the individuals that have these ponies, though, are illiterate. So you could have left the posters set around the clinics and you try to educate people. But we always had to make sure that we had a veterinary student from one of the Thai universities standing by the poster, pointing to the pictures and reading the text so that you wouldn't embarrass the individuals that couldn't read about the diseases you know, that you were discussing. He wanted to develop relationships of really respect and trust with these individuals because they owned the ponies. We came in here with all of this great knowledge, but to try to transmit that to people who are on the lower end of the economic scale can be really a challenge. Uh, there were two factions within the city, one that wanted to work with us and one that didn't. You don't want to take sides when you're in a, a different land and, you know, and there are cultural differences, there are religious differences, and what you don't want to do is take a side and then alienate half of the people that you really want to work with because they all own these ponies. Whatever we did, whether it was calcium or wound management or anything else, had to be affordable because these people were really on the line. And so we just decided we would educate. And so we started out with our workshops. And this is Dr. Syria, my colleague, who's giving a, a lecture to the group. Again, lots of words, but a lot of talk to go along with that. And you had to have incentives to get people to come to these talks. Because again, most of our seminars start out with people sitting on the floor in a garage working on rice mats and discussing diseases. And so we had to rent chairs. And for this picture, we encouraged them to please sit in the chairs. So we were talking about these conferences later. We would. Uh, show that we're making some progress. And this is Nick, our vet tech at that point, who actually was able to get the better attention of most of the carriage owners because as a man, he had greater respect even though he wasn't a veterinarian. And that helped get people coming to the meetings. But the biggest reason they came, as we wanted to institute permanent change, is if you notice over here on the side, they're bags. Those are bags of feet. If you stay to the end of the lecture, you've got a bag of feet. And so we had people who would donate the feed to us. And by doing that, we were able to get people to come to these conferences and start instituting change, bringing education, doing all of that. The immediate need was to control the big head disease. But the question was, they've always had the same diet. And so why was it different? And the reason it was different is that Oconomowoc, Wisconsin is like Milwaukee. It's a bedroom community for the wealthy to have a second home. Lampang became a really popular tourist destination. Flights from Bangkok to the north are cheap. 
Bangkok's hellishly hot in the summer, Lampang's pretty comfortable. So people were flying up to Lampang, building these big homes on the periphery of the town, where the pastures were, where the ponies always end up, went out and were able to have a day off of work, have a little bit of extra sunshine, vitamin D transduction, and they were on the razor edge of calcium phosphorus imbalance until these big homes came in that prevented the ponies from getting out of town on the edge and having a day off of work to graze. So when they were kept home, they were kept in the paddock by their home that had a big black tarp covering every single paddock to shed monsoon rains. So the ponies still got a day off of work, but they got a day off of work in a dark shed. And that's how close they were to a nutritional imbalance that was barely keeping them in check. So initially we had to import calcium, and then we finally developed an in-country source, and Thais really loved to have things that are of Thai origin, so we're able to make a difference. This just shows you a couple of advanced cases of big head disease, things that we looked at, not only the big swollen facial bones, but you'd run your hand down the, the front of the limbs on the periosteal surface, and I'd never heard a pony groan before from pain. And the question was, if we supplement calcium, can we turn them around? Can we turn these ponies that are essential to their lives back to a functioning, working individual? And the answer was yes. But what we couldn't do is get the facial bones to decline in size. That, that thinning was permanent, but you could get them working again. So we're starting to build a trusting relationship with the owners of the ponies and to make a difference. And, and you'll notice, too, the ponies in Lampang are all really brightly decorated, and they're really pretty cool. They have wood cards on them. But we started developing trust with these. And is that me? That I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're going to make change, you have to know what's the most important. So we started uh, collecting statistics. This goes back to the very beginning. And we realized that sort of lameness, wound care, diarrhea, colic, infectious disease, really high on the list, as well as reproductive problems. Well, reproduction is compromised by poor nutrition, all of that. But we had to start cataloging really what our biggest problems were, which we started doing. We also found out that poverty affects a lot of people's access to normal supplies. And this was kind of the creative fairy that we found there. And if you notice the bottom two, that's just a chunk of rubber to try to protect that pony's foot they thought from the asphalt and the nails were way inside the, the hoof wall. And if the nail fell out, you had this pad of rubber that was terrible. Shoes that were homemade, often really thick on one side, thin on the other because they were handmade. That wasn't great. And so we just continued on working with WISPA that now has a new name. It was World Society for the Protection of Animals and got our first grant. And in 2004, we actually opened our first pony clinic in the northern, northern region. And there were three of us, Dr. Chung Kamrai, myself, and Nana Lutherson, who's from Iceland. So we had three women who'd gone into this area where women don't often have much of a presence to try to do something about the welfare of these ponies. And in Thailand, the more monks you have at a ceremony, the more auspicious it is, the more a big deal it is. And so we had as many as we could afford at our opening <laughs> ceremony as we started our clinic. And if you notice, there's a roll of a ball of string over here by this, the head dude, and that string went all the way around every building, every truck, everything, in the entire facility, so when the blessing was given, which is a really important thing, culturally, it was all included in the blessing because it was within the string. And I, I learned a lot over there, and sometimes I just listen because I don't want to mess up and, and really offend anybody, and, and with my mouth, it's easy to do. Okay. <laughs> And so we also realized that we have to do not only wound care, we have to take care of nutrition with calcium, but we have a real big problem with ponies hauling carriages on asphalt streets in the city of Lamahang. Farriery became really important. So we brought in a Dutch farrier who over two or three years taught a lot of the Lamahang carriage owners how to become farriers. So they had a new way to make their living. And they didn't have to drive a carriage anymore, but they could do foot care. And all of a sudden, the, the footsteps that you would hear in the Lampang Street started to sound better. And we ended up importing some properly made pony shoes from Malaysia that were affordable so that they could do that. And we started selling the in-country made calcium supplement. So we were taking care of nutrition. We were taking care of the farriery. And we had better foot care. And these guys, even though some of them couldn't read the certificate, it says that they were a certified Lampang farrier. And they took really great pride in this. So it was, it was a really neat transition. We were looking at some other areas, looking at harnessing, and if you notice, harnessing on this pony is made out of split inner tubes. And so that was the only money that they could afford. This pony happens to be in Cambodia, 
but there was no brake on this thing, so if you go down a slope and you have a heavy load on the cart and the pony needs to stop, the only way he stops is with his body weight if he can stop the forward progression of the cart. So we had a lot of tail lesions on these guys too if they didn't fall and get harmed. And then because they couldn't afford bits, they would use pieces of wire for the bits. We saw a lot of wounds in Cambodia. Again, other things that we had to address to say how can we make it affordable and make improvements and to look at general health care and we continued continue ed education there too. Then again, we found out that only two of the first 200 ponies we dealt with had ever had so much as a single tetanus toxoid. So what a great opportunity. What are the diseases that are important there? So instead of just willy-nilly vaccinating what we would think might be important in the West, we took blood samples from all of these, and we tried to find out what exactly was, was the problem. And again, uh, it was just convincing the, the pony owners that if we found a devastating disease from our perspective, that we wouldn't take their pony from them, because then they might starve to death. They couldn't feed their kids if they lost their pony as a working equity. And we said, if indeed we find something really horrible, we will replace your pony if we need to. We won't let the government just take it away from them and leave you devastated. So these are the things that we tested for early on, because we had no idea what we were going to find. And just to give you a quick run through of the results, during small amounts, thankfully nothing for glanders. Pyroplasmosis, pretty big deal over there. EIA, definitely had some. That's the Coggins test for the vet students here that we test for. Influenza, only low titers. Herpes virus, oh yeah, it was there. Uh, equine viral arteritis, so just a few. Lepto, significant presence, not horribly overwhelming. And then scrub equi that causes strangles. Holy Moses, you know, we have, we have an issue there. And then the last thing we wanted to test for was West Nile virus and Japanese encephalitis. They're closely related. Initially, we thought we had a lot of West Nile virus, but what we actually had was Japanese B encephalitis. And for that reason, Michigan State's Olin Center said, before you go next time, how about we get you a series of Japanese B encephalitis vaccines? Because we know it's there, and it's like, I'm on. Until I found out they were $175 a piece. But you know, that's better than the disease. Um, and so we had observations that came out of this thing that we had uh, exposure to a lot of these really high morbidity diseases. And yet, I didn't see a single pony that looked like it had ever had strangles. We didn't see any abscesses. Like, how is this possible? And so, was there some natural disease resistance potentially with these ponies? What made them special? There were zoonotic diseases there that were critical, and I wanted to find out then genetically were there some DNA markers or something that made these ponies particularly resistant to these things, or was there anything else about them that was special? So we ended up going farther up north, and I didn't look like anybody else on the trip. You know, everybody else is tired or whatever else, and so we were at a pickup truck, we were driving up there, and the muddy roads were washed out, so we got pulled over by the local constabulary. And it just said, who are you? Because this is drug territory, and you're probably a drug lord. And it's like, no one's ever thought I'd be lord anything, much less a drug lord. <laughs> and so he pulled us over, and his rifle was longer than he was tall. And so he gets off, and I'm thinking, oh, we're going to get a citation. He pulls out his camera, so before anything else, he wanted to have a picture with all of us together. And I thought, fine. And then he learned that we saw these encampments with all of these mules. These are real drug mules. You've heard the term used for people who swallow drugs. It's a Buddhist country that won't euthanize animals that are basically homing pigeons for drugs. And so you see all of these mules that are captured with drugs on their back from northern Burma and northern Thailand, and they have to keep them until they die of natural death. Because if you turn them loose, they run back to the southern Thailand and Burma, and they'll load them up again, and they'll have their job again, so they stay there forever. But this, this, this is the nature of the roads that we were driving through most of the way up there. And this guy was a village leader here, but he said, sorry, one of the monks said that we were not to work with you, but can we please have a picture first? And I said, of course. <laughs> and so we do get to San Maquette, which was another village, and this is Azua, who was one of the village leaders, and he let us sample ponies for DNA testing, for blood samples, to look at health care. And all of the colts looked fabulous. They had really nice body condition. Every mare looked like this, down in that lower image, really bone thin. And we said, but it's all in the same diet. Why do the, the males, the intact males, very few geldings, look so great? And he goes, well, they work. 
And we said, well, what about the mirrors? And they go, they don't work. They only have pregnancies and lactate and have the next generation of ponies, but they didn't feel the need to feed them the same way because they weren't doing anything. And it's like, really talk to your wives. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Unfortunately, Azua, about two years after this, died of alcohol intoxication, very similar to Native Americans who had an influence of Westerners coming in, but a really nice guy. We stayed at his home, so when someone said, what hotels do you stay in? It's like, oh, not. Uh, we did at Azua's home, though, have felt mats, where at least we're away from the, the bulk of the mosquitoes. This was his kitchen next to his home, and we cooked all of the meals while we were there over a wood fire, and we had tree stumps to chop up broccoli and whatever other veggies they had, but he did have porcelain feet for a toilet, which is nice, so otherwise you need to serve out in the woods. But these were typical signs from Sun Laquette and the work that we were doing up north, and again, we were collecting samples for DNA from a variety of the ponies in these northern regions and properly documenting their appearance and doing what we could to really keep track of them. And the question I had, because so many of them had a physical appearance, phenotypical, phenotypically appearance that was similar to Shevalsky, not Kreswalski, it's pronounced Shevalsky, and I thought, are they potentially related? So we started looking at not only just is there some genetic difference, but do they, might we really have something that relates back to the last sort of wild, non-domestic non horse? And a lot of them had really interesting colorations. What we found out is that the type pony is a whole variety of things, and, and phenotypes are not very helpful. And they could be brown, they could be spotted, they could be black, they could be, look like Shabalski, they could be gray. And that didn't help, so we realized we had to keep doing other testing. Ponies were used for work, and this is a typical kiddo going up for his day's work. He, he couldn't read, but uh, he loved his pony. And there's a little A-frame that sits on top of the pad on this pony's back. And if you notice, it has a poop strap and a, and a chest strap. And this A-frame sits on top. So if you're in the mountains and you load something heavy and the squirty pony has to do its job, but if it's imbalanced and it's on a really steep mountain and, and he takes a misstep, the load falls off. So the pony is saved. So I mean, it was actually a kind of neat adaptation to keep them safe. Ponies up north are also used by the kids who are spending their two years as a monk. Azua was our interpreter up north, and he also had a tourist trade that he used. And again, back to the the carriage owners with their cowboy hats, the sugar cane loads, and then this one is in Cambodia. And if you look at the body conditions for this little pony, but again, critical to the livelihood of these people. The pony clinic continued to grow and thrive, and we had a lot of times ponies coming in on the backs of usually Ford Ranger pickup trucks. That would seem to be their favorite. And we can't load horses on trailers here, and they drop a tailgate and the pony jumps up. That's probably genetic too. Uh, <laughs> But we could bring them in, but we couldn't do surgical management of colic. But if the owners realized that they brought the pony to the clinic, this is one of our technicians in the dark blue shirt. This is the owner. They walk all night long. If you have an impaction colic, you hold the IV pole and you walk with your pony throughout the night, and most of them survive. But it's pretty intense. We went on into Cambodia, which is another whole thing because of what happens from the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot and how many people have suffered. Again, if you look at the body conditions for this little guy in the harness, it leaves a lot to be desired. But these were people taking poultry to market, don't have refrigerator trucks, and so you basically bind three or four birds together, tie up their legs, throw them in the van, and just keep building until you have them all assembled, and then you take off the market with these live birds hanging off of your vehicle. If you arrive at the market and they're dead, you sell them at a discount. Otherwise, you sell them live poultry. So welfare, again, on many aspects, you don't criticize the people because their welfare is worse. And that's something else you have to recognize. You can't take for granted that everybody's being cruel because they're not. They're doing the best they can. So this is, again, uh, back with our, our Cambodian veterinarians. And they're helping us do a survey of the people who only speak Khmer and looking at a variety of health issues of these ponies. But again, using statistics, trying to actually build a case for what's needed. Early on, our blood sampling for the DNA project was still blood at the time. Found that we had a certain percentage of these ponies actually had some unique genetic markers. So we started them with hair samples to see what further we could learn from them using the UC Davis Vet Genetics Lab. And we realized quickly early on, phenotype was not a good marker to find the ponies that had the, the DNA markers. So we had to continue with our, our sample 
collection. This is just looking at one of the spotted ponies that actually turned out to have the markers that we needed. And we used the loci that were suggested by the genetics lab at UC Davis. And we found out that they have markers that are pretty distinct for different breeds. And the one thing that came out at the end of the day was that our Southeast Asian ponies really were distinct from domestic horses, and that was sort of the take-home message. I'm not going to go into allele frequencies today. That would be a bit over the top. So we wanted to find out why do so many of our ponies look like Chevalskys when indeed it just seemed to be the luck of the draw because although they are similar, they're not the same. Chevalskys don't have much of a forelock. Our ponies did. They had some other markers that were similar. But that's how it was. So these are some pictures we had from a trip to Mongolia. A lot of the horses had what appeared to be ancient horse markings, tiger stripes on the legs, some kind of short forelocks. But the people always found us more fascinating than we probably did to them. But we always marked where we took the pictures, where we had the samples collected, the ages. And again, this is Dr. Chun Kamrai on this one portion. So what we wanted to find out is how do we bring opportunity to the villagers? If we have a subset of the ponies that have this DNA that matters, what do we do for the broader population? How can we make a difference for welfare? First off, bringing education to people, letting them know how to care for their ponies better is really critical. If we can increase the livelihood and the longevity of these ponies, that helps the welfare of the people who own them. If they learn that proper wound management and cleaning things up will make their pony live longer and better, so if we work hard for them, that has an impact. And you have a greater impact on children than you do the old buggers who have been beating their horses and donkeys for years. So you really focus on children and education. And just trying to increase the Thai government's interest in these ponies that they really do matter and we started looking at where did they come from. If we have genetic markers that are important, where did they come from at all? T Road, everybody has heard of the Silk Road, but there was also a T Road early on historically. And we started looking at tea coming in, all the tea from China, it really did come from China. And so it's coming points south, east, and west from China, and early on it was carried by people. Well, that gets pretty old fast. So they started using ponies. And along with people come ponies, come dogs, and so Thai dogs look like Chinese dogs. They're all you know, pretty close in, in how they appear. And so the transport then went on to, to ponies, and that's why we ended up going to Mongolia for our testing of the ponies up north saying, are they related to our Thai ponies? Is that where they came from? And even though this appears as a straight line from Mongolia down to northern Thailand, this is really mountainous region. It's pretty treacherous stuff. But we did a lot of testing. And we found out that our ponies genetically trace back to the Mongolian horse with very little genetic divergence, which again is interesting to the Thais because they want to know where they're from. They want to know, are they original people? And they people went from Thailand to China. Well, sorry, they came from China down towards Thailand. And we wanted to say, what do we need to do to preserve these ponies, improving their welfare, yes, but also improving the foundation numbers that we have for these ponies and so we could prove that there was minimal divergence genetically, that we could talk about the migration, at least of the northern Thai people. And right now we're back to about 1,400, 1,500 years, way pre Genghis Khan in the origin. And this shows the phylogenetic tree of what we found from our initial studies of big head disease, how far our trips have led us. Chevalsky's way over here is the last non domestic horse that's alive, but our Thai pony is sort of on that side of the tree along with the Norwegian Fjord, and if you think about color patterns and all of that, we'd like to have a link, but unfortunately, the type ponies are going to So, but we, we made a little bit of a case that they're, they're certainly distinct from these other breeds. So anyway, we have ongoing efforts. We've had two documentary films to date that have actually, uh, one is in Thai and one is in English. They both played on, on the equivalent of Thai public television. And just talking to people about their ponies and how to improve their welfare, and why they should care about them because of their history. So two years ago, we finally got the meeting we've been praying for, which is at the Thai Minister of Agriculture. She's quite a stern woman, sort of the equivalent of the Secretary of Agriculture. And we had three hours to meet with her. The first hour was in English, and the other two hours, as I was sitting next to Dr. Chung Kamrai, it was everything was in Thai. It was a really hot room. She said, if I hit, hit you with my elbow, nod and smile. And I said, I can do that. And whatever it was, I had no idea what happened for two hours. But two hours later, the Minister of Agriculture finally agreed to complete our nationwide survey of DNA for Thai ponies to help us find the rest of the ponies before they disappeared so we could actually start the Thai Native Pony Registry. 
when you're in Cambodia, we have the Cambodian Native Pony Registry. When I'm here, I talk about the Southeast Asian Native Pony Registry because they all really originated back from the Chinese group. And our goal is to actually do what we can to maintain their population, the health and the welfare, continue the education. The Khmer veterinarians who come to our workshops take that information home. It's very much a land-grant model of spreading education and going from where we are to trying to help people know about wound care, nutrition, and health care, what vaccinations are important. And the cool thing is, bottom line is the, the carriage use has actually increased because people visiting the town as tourists used to hear the lame ponies and they would deny taking a carriage ride because they thought, nah, they didn't, they didn't really want to beat up on that poor pony that was in poor health. Their body condition scores have improved, their feet are better, they have nice shoes on, and carriage use has increased, which means those that are not farriers now actually have more in carriage and more tourist trade, and their economic base has actually improved too, which is, is really nice. And so the, the point that I, I would like to end with, and I've got just a little video clip from one of the, hope I'm okay on time-wise, good, uh, is to really talk about why these things matter to me, not just on the, the health basis. They're used as working efforts, and they will be for the, the distant future, probably. Human transport, carrying goods to market, farming and agriculture, that's always going to be a part they play, and tourism. But the one thing that's really critical about these ponies is that they have really big hearts. I mean, they're just, they want to please, and they're really cool. And there's something we talk about in this country. We have Beekman Center close by, and it's looking at horses and, and horse riding therapy and how important that can be. And what I want to do is just show you a little bit from uh, one of our documentaries, and hopefully this will work. And there was a gentleman we met up there whose daughter was autistic. And uh, the local doctors had pretty much told him that there wasn't anything that they could do for him because they didn't have the, the therapy and the care and the, and the means to really reach this little girl and it was just how she was going to be for the rest of her life. And this was a really caring dad. So there's some images here. I'm going to back this up just a little bit more because I think I've got a few minutes to do this. Do I? Okay, great. Well, this, this runs five minutes. Do I have five minutes? I believe you do. Then let's do this. Okay, so this, if I get the sound up and running, hang on. And it, it just shows a little bit about, what we were, if hopefully nobody's telling me, some of you might speak tight, I don't know. But this, this is from Tony and I don't know. There you go. But this shows, again, I'm going to turn down the volume just a little bit. Nothing like the one quite a bit better, but just some of the scenes from Lampang, so these guys are in pretty good shape. And this is the way most of the colts were fully got there, but now even the mares are looking better. But these are ponies that are going out in their, their work day, and just some scenes uh, within the city and around the city of Lampang. And they have a, a white horse that greets you on every main road going into Lampang because of this hundred plus year history of carriage trades. And these are just some of the ponies on their work day. This is Kun Un, who is the uh, president of the Lampang Pony Owners Association. When we first met him, he said, uh, no, you can't see the ponies. And it's like, we've just driven all the way back north for big head disease. And he said, but you'll have to come meet with me. So we met with him. He had us meet with Thai military officials because the Thai military is kind of all pervasive across the country. And after three hours, Kun Un finally let us go to see some of these horses that were in those back stall areas that were quite ill. But he's a really cool dude. He spent time in Germany, so we conversed better in German than we did even in English. But he was very proud of their, their carriages and all. This is Dr. Syria, and so we're going to skip past some of this, because this could go on a long time. If you've heard anything about the long races they have in Mongolia, the young children get on these ponies, and if you notice, their body condition score is not great, but these are really healthy horses that have great feet. And these little kids, they might as well Velcro on the back of these ponies, but this, these are the origins of our Thai ponies, and, and it just kind of is part of this thing of showing these young children and who wins this race is a really big deal every year. And yet, they're, they're thin, but I gotta tell you, they're hardy. They're pretty cool. Okay. Right. We're going to skip through a little bit. And I want to 
to show you this because this is what happens with crossbreds. People were thinking carriage, people weren't riding in the carriages because the ponies are so small. Small is good over there. So they start crossbreeding with some thoroughbreds off the track. And if you notice the respiratory efforts on this guy, he wasn't coping well, he was not heat tolerant, he was not disease tolerant, and, and just couldn't stand the, the conditions in Thailand. But the native ponies do really well. They're really, they're made for this thing. They do quite nicely in that environment. And so, we'll continue on. Sorry, Dr. Syria, I'm gonna skip through this. So we went um, to a couple of the facilities and again, cowboy hats to see it <laughs> when you're lumping, that's the norm. And it's really the last two minutes. When I get to this thing, I want to I'll go, go back to this guy. You can see the, the carvings on his carriage and this big pony again is a crossbred. You can see how it's breathing. Not doing so hot, native ponies are better, and those who are not crossbred do better. But then we met this, this dad, and it, it, to me it's that universal thing. It doesn't matter whether you're a parent here, or a parent in Southeast Asia, or Ethiopia, wherever you are. You care about your family, you care about your kids. And this dad had been told that there was nothing he could do for his daughter. And it really bothered him, and he said, I have to try something. This is at the Lump Pine Pony Clinic. We're actually doing ultrasound. We have medicine practicing. This is one of our CE meetings with people on the rice mats, the barriers doing their thing. We really had an impact, at least on that front, to educate the kids, because the old buggers sometimes don't listen. And this was the dad. And he was concerned because his daughter, he didn't feel, could get the attention that she needed. And so he started talking about her and what he wanted for her future. So of course they had to show the parasite scratching the bottom of the whole farm. But then we move on to his little daughter. And this he's just such a neat guy. And his daughter, he noticed, was always interested in the ponies. And he said, well, maybe there's something I as a dad can do. So he took her and he just tossed her on the back of the pony and started doing lunging with this pony and you know helping her balance, helping her kind of get that closer link with the pony she loved. And it evolved in a fairly short order. And how this ended up is what I wanted to do to finish today. This is in a very short transition time. So my point is, human, horse, animal minds really matter. And what we do with welfare for the ponies has broader implications than many of us can even begin to envision. But this was just one of the really cool things that I thought was an offshoot that it works in Thailand just like it does a people in other places. Um, I 
the only thing I have left right now are the trailers, but I do have the English trailer too that goes more into the DNA collection. It's part of the stuff from the UC Davis genetics lab. So, I, I mean, I could share that material with you. Yeah, because that would be neat to have a CD of it or just DVD. Never thought of it. We do have actually the Lump on Pony Welfare Organization, and we have a Cambodian Pony Welfare Organization, and we also have a 501c3 here. So, if people wanted to make donations, all of those things are possibilities too. Maybe that would be a way to raise money and to sell right. DVDs or something. Thank you, I appreciate that. We're always interested in having more money from the ponies. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, did you find anything genetically in terms of uh, disease resistance? Uh, not yet. And so in, what we're trying to do right now is a question is what about disease resistance and the serial prevalence work that we have done with the uh, University of Kentucky Blocking Fund Research Center has pretty much wrapped up and until we can go back to the original DNA data and say, can we match up the ones that had that 15, 20% of DNA and we found higher percentages than some others, that's the only way to cross link it with the serial prevalence data, work in progress. But right now we do know that we, we have lots of diseases there that should be problematic and we, other than thin ponies and terrible body condition scores and a lot of the wound healing, we've never seen evidence of those other diseases but we know they were exposed. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you folks, I appreciate your time.